The content of this podcast has not been evaluated by Health Canada or the FDA. It is educational in nature and should not be taken as medical advice. Always consult a qualified medical professional to see if a diet, lifestyle change, or supplement is right for you. Any supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please note that the opinions of the guests or hosts are their own and may not reflect those of Advanced or the Molecular Research Incorporated. Welcome to Supplementing Health, a podcast presented by Advanced Orthomolecular Research. We are all about applying evidence-based and effective dietary, lifestyle, and natural health product strategies for your optimal health. In each episode, we will feature very engaging clinicians and experts from the world of functional and naturopathic medicine to help achieve our mission to empower people to live their best lives naturally. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to Supplementing Health. Today, we're joined by Rochelle Robinet, registered herbalist, to get the herbalistic perspective on hormones. Rochelle is the founder of Supernatural, a New York-based company dedicated to the modern herbalism education. After thousands of hours coaching people to better health naturally, Rochelle designed these classes to bring herbal wellness into the daily lives of others. Welcome, Rochelle. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, thank you. Before we dive into the nitty gritty of how we can use plants to help us reach and maintain hormone balance, I'd love to hear a bit more about how you found your passion in this space. Absolutely, yeah. Um, You know, I think it, it sounds cliche to say that it found me or that, you know, it was something that the world was asking for from me, but it is really the truth. Um, I have always been interested in the sort of human experience and how this mind and body and sort of um, vehicle that we move through the world in responds to what we take in. So food and drink and light and ideas and everything, you know, in our environment uh, affects our experience of life. And so that is sort of the essence of what I've always been drawn to. And it's taken me through a lot of different um, paths, uh, kind of meandering through food and nutrition and um, the world's religions and kind of spirituality uh, into, you know, herbs and supplements and fitness, which I love dearly. And all of, you know, those studies, which I've been really absorbed in since I was a kid, became this kind of holistic practice. And the only term (laughs) that I know that really sums up, you know, something that is that holistic, we're talking about mind and body and, you know, what we eat and drink and sleep and all of it, um, is, is the practice of herbalism. And, you know, you could say naturopathic health, health as well, holistic health. And that is that sort of moment when I realized like that is what herbalism is. It is this holistic practice that became sort of a title for me, Um, you know, and I would say from a career standpoint, you know, I, I never intended to be an herbalist. I never even intended to work in health, actually. But there was a point in time where enough people said, I want to know what you're doing with your life. I want to know your food. I want to know your supplements. I want, I want your practices. Can you teach me that that became a turning point and I started to teach? Long story short. <laughs> awesome. And um, so then do you work in the spiritual aspect into like the herbal and natural um, ingredient aspect all into one in your educational uh, se- sessions? I would say that in my work with clients and and classes and kind of, you know, across the board, I I take a very holistic approach. So a lot of times people hear herbalist and they come to me for herbs and we might not talk about herbs in the first session or the second or the third or the fourth. We might, but it depends on where you are in your individual life. So I would say I always start with food and then I move into herbs and supplements. And the lens through which I work with herbs is uh, global. So there are, you know, as you know, there are, there are medicinal systems like traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and many more that have concepts that can be spiritual, they can be energetic, um, they can be a lot of, you know, different things. And I respect those 
and I'll take those into consideration if I'm working with somebody who resonates with those um, ideas and concepts, or if I'm working with uh, formulas, herbal formulas from those medicinal systems. Um, I don't know if spirituality is the right term for, for the way that I work with people, but I would say that a lot of times it feels a lot like therapy. <laughs> so we're, we're definitely getting into, um, you know, the motivations behind our behaviors, our cravings, our desires to change or our inability to change. And if someone has a spiritual practice um, or a mindfulness practice or, you know, any other kind of practice, then we'll definitely consider that. But I don't, I don't sort of inject it if it's not already there. That makes sense. So what are some of the most common imbalances that you see in your practice? Uh, uh, you know, they haven't changed in, in the time that I've been working. I've seen the same imbalances over and over again. So it's clear that humanity has its kind of pillars of struggle. Um, those tend to be digestion and gut health issues, uh, hormone imbalances, energy and kind of brain health uh, matters, stress and anxiety, sleep issues, and then metabolism and weight loss. I'd say those are my, um, that's what I'm most frequently dealing with. I'm not surprised. I mean, it makes sense that those would be kind of the groups that you see. Um, yeah. And a lot of those actually do overlap as well, right? Like hormone balance, imbalances mm -hmm. affect, can affect digestion, can affect sleep, can are obviously driven partially by stress as well. So uh, within that hormone imbalance category, uh, what are some of the biggest things that you end up having to deal with, with your customers or your clients? Yeah. And yeah, what you just mentioned there about the overlap, that's, that's where the magic happens, right? It's like when we realize that the skin health, um, the skin and beauty concerns are actually coming from gut health, you know, it's like then the world opens up or we realize we realize the cause of our symptoms which is really my goal with people is to understand the cause of our symptoms as opposed to just treating the symptoms from a hormone balance a hormone imbalance standpoint i think one of the big things that i see is um stress hormone imbalance usually we're talking about sex hormones but stress hormone imbalance like high cortisol chronically high cortisol is super common obviously um, there's a lot of estrogen dominance. PCOS is very common, um, you know, and that tends to be uh, related to metabolic issues, less to hormone imbalances as the cause. Um, lots of lots of people who are ending courses of birth control and wanting to regain hormone balance after that. Lots of skin issues as a result of um, hormone imbalances, and then lots of PMS symptoms that are just like you know unnecessarily intense and a little bit of menopause. Um, I don't see a ton of clients uh, with that sort of challenge, but I do see plenty. I would say it's just not as common as some of those other issues. And do you find there's a certain age range that um, tend to be most affected? Knowing, of course, there's always going to be outliers from that. Yeah, I think you know, it might also just be the nature of my community and the, and the, the age range of the people that I treat most often. But um, 20s, ages 20, in the 20s and 30s, I see the most amount of PMS, um, PCOS, skin um, complaints, and uh, just kind of generalized hormone imbalance. Also, you know, the fertility interest, which is huge. Right. Yeah. And that makes sense as far as the age range as well. So do you think some of those issues like PCOS um, and fertility issues be come up because of kind of the life stage they're in rather than maybe the hormone imbalance existing only in that time frame? Um, yes, I do. Yeah. I think the I think that if I were treating, you know, teenagers, for example, um, I would see hormone imbalance in that age range as well, and it would be different symptoms. So I think, um, you know, I think there are a couple different like factors at play in terms of tying the hormone issue. I, look, I think, <laughs> I think the hormone imbalances that we're seeing as a people um, are becoming, they're, they're becoming, you know, more and more lifelong, right? Like they're becoming a struggle earlier in our lives and they're lasting longer and they're becoming more severe um 
because they're not the they're not the cause, right? Other things are causing those imbalances, um, and that's that becomes the symptom, which then causes other symptoms. So, so what do you think some of the main drivers of that extended imbalance within the body? are yeah i think some of the main affects i know some of the main affects are um it, it, diet and lifestyle um so nutrition is is huge uh what we're eating you, you know then affects our uh, body composition and body fat and that affects our hormone hormone levels um chronic levels of stress you know in the relationship between cortisol and estrogen um and others but especially that one is quite clear um, so we're not eating eating very well. Uh, we're over caffeinating. Caffeine and alcohol both affect the hormone balance. We're having you know processed food and a lot of sugar, which also affects our hormone levels. Um, whether or not you're on a plant based diet, you know most people are still not. That's going to affect things, which just goes back to to food quality, um, sleep, and then. Um, I mean, I think that, and then, you know, lifestyle, so again, it's just stress and sleep and, you know, that's a lot of reasons, right? But all of those things are the, you know, top five contributors to hormone imbalances. So, you know, you, you, you manage to manage those and you may not even need herbs. Right. Uh, I think the other, the other big piece of hormone balance is liver health. So I always work with uh, liver support when we're working on hormone balance as well. But I definitely start with food and lifestyle uh, because that tends to be the cause and tends to make the biggest difference. So then which herbal remedies do you find have the widest range of treatment capabilities? Like, are there certain ones that you find kind of touch every single patient or the majority compared to others that are more tailored to very specific situations? Yeah, the, actually, yes. Um, so, you know, not to be redundant, but food is going to be the first one. Food as medicine is, is major. Um, and even something like increasing fiber uh, can help with detoxification in the body, right? And when we're doing that, we're supporting the liver's function, improving that function. The liver filters hormones out of the blood. So that there, like eating more fiber might help balance your hormones. It also can help balance your blood sugar, which again is gonna help overall. So it seems so unrelated and yet it's not at all. So that's an example of one of the approaches that like, can everybody eat more fiber? 100%. But is that a sexy herb? No. So I have to give the herbs too. And some of those are uh, an herb called Chastberry or Vitex. Um, that works really well it works through the pituitary gland to increase luteinizing hormone, um, which essentially helps to reduce estrogen in the body. And I use Chast or Vitex with my clients in their 20s and 30s to help normalize cycle regularity, to help clear up um, acne, to help minimize PMS symptoms. Uh, and then you can also use chast along with black cohosh. They actually work better together. Um, you can use those and some other herbs for menopausal symptoms. Uh, the, the other herbs there would be sage, mother, wart, and licorice. Uh, but chast is phenomenal. Black cohosh together, those are really great. And then I think the liver support is also great for all ages and that you know is nothing crazy it just tends to be um if i'm doing a supplement it would be let's see like a dandelion root burdock root milk thistle um you know maybe some turmeric and then lots of fiber and water with your great diet and that alone that combination alone i use over and over and over again with great success do you incorporate a lot of like leafy greens for the DIM that they produce, like things like broccoli and whatnot as well to help support the liver? I am such a fan of, fan of greens. Yes, everyone more greens. <laughs> it's, it is top of my list um, for food. Yeah, totally. Do you have tips then on ways to cook them or serve them um, so that people, because things like kale kind of have a bad rap, right? They, mm -hmm. they're they kind of boring, bland, not some, just overly healthy and not fun. So do you have tips on how to make them quote unquote fun? 
<laughs> yeah, I really do. Um, I have lots of recipes that I share uh, with clients and also publicly. I have a show um, on YouTube that's all just recipes and, and they're all food with, you know, functional herbs worked in. Um, my website has lots of recipes and yeah, I would say that I'm talking about food about as often as I'm talking about herbs because, you know, yep, they go, they're, they're one and the same, you know, they're one and the same. Yeah, absolutely. So then do you usually recommend certain herbal re remedies for a set period of time and then reassess with your clients to make sure that you're seeing the effects you're looking for? Or, or is it pretty much safe to continue with that set regimen indefinitely? Yeah, it's so with herbs, um, there's usually not, you know, there are always exceptions, but there's usually no need to stop taking herbs. It's kind of like saying, do you only need to eat broccoli until you feel better, right? It's like, no, we should probably have it forever. Um, herbal support is the same. Now, of course, there are some herbs that are going to be exceptionally strong or unnecessary to take for a period of time or more often you feel better and you don't necessarily need the same dose right or you might want to try a different blend or something in your life changed and you needed you need an adjustment but i like to i like to break down the idea that herbs are only safe for a short period of time um, because generally they're safe to mix they're safe to have all day long. I cannot count the number of herbs that I ingest on a daily basis. And um, there isn't really a need to take breaks. You know, they're just helping us as we consume more of them. And, and I, I do like to draw the analogy to like eating your vegetables. You know, we, we should never stop that. So um, great question, common question, uh, but keep, keep your herbs up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So do you know then if any herbal options are unsafe to take during like, I'm thinking pregnancy and breastfeeding, because I know those are kind of time periods where mm. a lot of things that can be done no problem when you're not pregnant or breastfeeding become controversial or concerning when you are in that stage of life. So is there a similar situation with some of the herbal remedies? Yeah, so with herbs, um, we, when I say we, I mean sort of herbalism in general, um, we tend to recommend um, food herbs only. So nothing that's like a concentrate or, um, you know, a tincture or something super strong. So you want to stick to food herbs only. If you're not sure if a certain herb is a food herb, then always err on the side of, you know, skipping it. And the reality is that there's a ton of use of herbs during pregnancy and nursing in traditional medicine. Um, however, there's very little science to confirm that that use is safe. So you can look at how people, you know, for thousands of years have been using plants. And if that's comfortable to you, you could, you know, do the same. But if you want science to say this herb is safe during pregnancy or while nursing, we're going to have to wait <laughs> because there are very, very, very few studies that say yay or nay for herbs. So again, it's less that there's a fear that these herbs are problematic. It's more the reality that there's just no science to confirm. So, right. Which is the case yeah. for a lot of things, because obviously that is a population that most people don't want to experiment with. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you know what I have to say, one other thing that, that we do recommend um, during that, that phase is um, teas. So teas are great. You know, it's it's when you get into capsules and um, tinctures and concentrates and these really um, potentized uh, formulations that it's better to avoid. So makes sense. Uh, now we've talked a little bit about the estrogens, uh, excess estrogen being one of the concerns that you see in especially younger women, uh, and part of that might be due to phytoestrogens in the diet, like soy soy milk and soy cheese and things has become a lot more popular as people move away from dairy and on to the non-dairy alternative. So can you talk a little bit about phytoestrogens and how that plays into the whole hormone replacement therapy plan and potentially causing those imbalances as well? Yeah, so that's really interesting because, um, you know, again, in herbalism, we'll use a lot of phytoestrogens to help 
balance the hormones. Um, but of course, we wouldn't say go off and eat a bunch of processed soy. Um, so there's, there's a quality and a quantity um, conversation that has to happen, you know, around phytoestrogens. But to give an herbal example, um, red clover is a, you know, plant, a weed that a lot of people will be familiar with. And red clover is considered a phytoestrogen and something we use all the time um, in hormone balancing and hormone supportive uh, blends. And the phytoestrogens help to normalize estrogen levels uh, by, you know, binding to those estrogen receptors. They're not actually estrogens, they just resemble estrogen. And red clover is not an adaptogenic herb, but that action tends to be adaptogenic in the sense that if your levels of estrogen are high, it can help lower them. If your levels are low, it can help raise them. So, you know, it's going to respond to the system according to what the system needs. So what I would say in short is that phytoestrogens are not bad and they aren't estrogens truly. Um, however, we, we want to be consuming um, whole food and herbs as opposed to concentrated processed things like lots of soy. Those, those rarely are a, a, a large um, you know, contributor to imbalances. I would say again, like liver health is important and really just whatever else you're eating. But it's an interesting thing with the phytoestrogens because they do get, they do have, um, there's, a, there's a little bit of fear around them, but they can also be really useful in the right forms. Now, so, I mean, I would just say one quick side note, there's also xenoestrogens um, in the environment in you know, products and water and that kind of thing. We don't want those. So that is also a good distinction for people to make. So they understand that environmental estrogens like xenoestrogens are different than phytoestrogens. And those can often be found in like beauty products and personal care products and cleaning products as well, correct? Exactly. Yep. Okay. So then for when you're working with clients, do you review some of those like um, detoxing your house kind of situations as part of the whole holistic plan? Yeah, we do. Yeah. It doesn't come up too, too often, but we will absolutely go there if we need to. Um, you know, I have a, a client right now who had some mysterious allergy-like symptoms. And after considering, you know, their whole environmental situation, we realized that it was coming from a wheat factory across the street that was producing a ton of flour that this person was inhaling on a regular basis. So it's, it is helpful to do that, um, to do that, you know, whole, whole life, uh, whole life consideration. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. So then you had mentioned adaptogenic herbs as well, which um, which ones do you use most often in your practice? Um, which adaptogenic herbs do I use most often? Yeah. So, yeah. So um, adaptogens are, uh, as you probably know, adaptogens are a small category of herbs um, that currently includes about 12 plants. Sometimes there's uh, maybe 20 in that category. We're kind of studying the rest of them still to find out if they're truly adaptogenic. And it's a really specific definition that the, the world has um, largely misunderstood be, since it's become popular. So adaptogens um, are the ginsengs, ashwagandha, rhodiola, uh, shilajit, um, cordyceps, and I don't know, one or two other, um, one or two others. So of those, I would say, that you know i don't give any preference to adaptogens it's really what's the best herb for the person so um in that category i probably use ashwagandha the most uh, which is a you know such a helpful herb for so many different things thyroid function cortisol levels um, overall stress uh, balance um, but for kind of stress and anxiety relief i prefer the category of herbs that are called nervines so those are herbs for your nervous system um, and you know when we're working with hormone balance we may not be working with any adaptogens or maybe just one like maybe licorice because licorice is also a phytoestrogen um 
so yeah, it it depends, but I would say the most popular adaptogen for me would probably be the ashwagandha. Okay, cool. And, and you'd mentioned thyroid there, which is another huge, I guess, group of hormones, another big piece that often affects um, women in particular, but men as well. So is there specific things you look at or consider when you're, you, when the thyroid is concerned? Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, that'll, that'll really depend on if thyroid function is high or low. Um, ashwagandha is a perfect example of an herb that can be helpful for hypothyroid conditions, but not hyperthyroid conditions. Um, let's see. I mean, there's, I definitely have a whole protocol, actually I have a whole class on both hormone balance and thyroid health. Uh, and you know, if someone goes through that process, they're going to get the whole, you know, holistic protocol for balancing those systems. And for thyroid, you know, that also includes looking at things like sources of iodine. So a really good herbal source of um, iodine, of course, is seaweeds, bladder rack is an example. Uh, let's see, for adrenal health, you know, one of my favorite blends is a combination of rhodiola, cordyceps, Eleuthero, Shisandra, Panax, ginseng, and licorice. And funny enough, those are all adaptogens, all of them, yep. Yeah. Um, so we kind of look at the adaptogens that are working on the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So that's why that would make sense for adrenal support. Um, but yeah, it's going to be case by case. Oh, diet is huge for thyroid health too. You know, if somebody is dealing with Hashimoto's, then we have to have the conversation about being gluten-free, which is just so important. And the immune system which plays in there too, uh, for autoimmune conditions. So it just, you know, keeps oh, going. It's yeah, <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. If our listeners want to um, follow you, learn from you, you have your website, www.yoursupernatural.com and your Instagram handle, Rochelle Robinette, correct? That is correct. Yep. The, and the website is the letter U and the letter R supernatural. Yeah. .com. Perfect. Those are the, those are the places we're all there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you for listening to supplementing health. For more information about our guests, past shows, and future topics, please visit aor.ca slash podcast or aor.us slash podcast. Do you have a topic you want us to cover? We invite you to engage with us on social media to request a future topic or email us at marketing at aor.ca. 